Robot Makers, here's 10 things you need to know if you're moving from Arduino to MicroPython. Arduino requires that you compile the code before you upload it to the board. Whereas on MicroPython, you simply just run the script from the IDE. You can also use the REPL to type commands in directly. On the Arduino, you need to use the library manager to bring in libraries that you want to use in your code. So here we've got DHT, which is a temperature sensor. So we can simply bring that in, install it, and that will work on our Arduino. On MicroPython, we need to make sure the file is actually installed on the device itself. So here I've got an SSD 1306 display, and if I want to use that with my rotary encoder program, that file needs to be installed on the Raspberry Pi Pico. As you can see, I've got it there installed. So MicroPython and the Arduino have completely different development environments. So for Python, or MicroPython, we can use a whole host of different ones. We can use the Python IDE, or the IDLE, the Integrated Development and Learning Environment. We have Visual Studio Code. We have Thony, Microsoft Make Code. We have Moo. We have PyCharm, which is a commercial one. There is a community version of this, but there is a paid version as well. And then there is Atom.io. Then on the Arduino side, we have Eclipse, which is a Java-based Arduino platform. Then we have Atom.io again, which is uh, interchangeable. And we have Visual Studio. There are some plugins for Arduino and Visual Studio. And then we have, obviously, the Arduino IDE as well. That comes in a few different flavors. There's the traditional IDE, which you can download onto Windows, Mac, Raspberry Pi, Linux. There is a cloud-based version, which has a small plugin for Chrome, and that can be used on Chromebooks as well as uh, any supported browser. And then there's the beta version of the IDE version 2, which is just coming out at the moment. I've tried that and I couldn't get that to work. It's probably something to do with my setup. The next thing is voltages. So there is usually a difference between the voltages between Arduino boards and MicroPython boards. Generally speaking, the Arduino, Uno and Mega are 5 volts. Uh, this is known as TTL in the industry uh, and it's quite standard for components. Uh, MicroPython, on the other hand, most of the development boards for this run on 3.3 volts. So it's much lower power, meaning that the, your battery will last longer on your, your projects. However, it does mean that we have to be considerate of that when we're plugging in components, because if we plug in a component with a 5 volt supply to a 3.3 volt pin, it will probably blow that pin up and damage your board. So just something to consider. The next thing is void versus def. So on the Arduino, if we want to create a function, I'll create a little blink function here just to demonstrate. We use the void, and void means that it doesn't return any values. Uh, if we were to return a value, we'd have to say what type of value that's going to be. Is it an integer? Is it a string? Is it a floating point number? Is it a boolean? And so on. So if we wanted to return true or false, for example, we'd set that to a bool boolean. However, if we're not returning a value, we simply say void. We then create the little squiggly brackets, the little curly braces to define the code block. So in here, we're simply going to cut and paste the code that we've got down here to make the light blink. Let me just cut that and paste that there. And then in our main loop, in the void loop, we can simply call that blink function like so. So I'm going to create the exact same program, but this time in MicroPython. So what we first need to do is just bring in from machine the pin, and we're also going to bring in the sleep. And then to create our, our new function, we use the def. So this is to define a function. And we're going to call this one blink, and we're simply going to say we need to define an LED first of all. So let me just very quickly move LED equals pin 25, and it's a pin dot out. It's an output. And then over here, we can then simply say LED dot on sleep for a second. LED dot off sleep for another second. And then we can create a main program down here while true blink. If I run that, I can see it blinking there on the board. So on the Arduino, if we want to create some variables, so let's create some numbers. I'm going to call this one A. I'm going to set that to zero. Uh, let's create a floating point number B. That's going to be one point. It's going to be 3.14. Let's have a true or false. So this is going to be. Let's have a string. So for each of these variables, I have to define what type the variable is before we can use it. So for the value A, 
setting to zero, we have to define that as an integer which takes up two bytes in memory. And the reason for this is because we're using C, C is a strongly typed language mean, but we have to define what the variables are before we use them. And then throughout the program, the compiler can check that the type of the variable doesn't change and therefore we're not introducing any bugs in our program. So we can't halfway through the program, if we've defined A as an integer, we can't then start using it as a floating point number. In fact, if we try and put a floating point number into the integer, the compiler will tell us that there's a problem with that. So over in Python, we can define a variable A equals one, B equals 1.1, C equals true, D equals hello like so. But Python doesn't require that you define what type those variables are before you use them. So we didn't have to say that A was an integer, we didn't have to say B was a floating point number and so on. We simply just assign the value to it and the interpreter, it will infer what type of object that you're going to use there. So A being set to one, it knows that one is a whole number, so it will set that to be an integer, whereas B has been set to 1.1, which it knows is a floating point number, so it'll appropriately put that as a float. And we can try that down here in the REPL. We say a equals one, and then we look at what type a is. We can see there it's a class integer. If we say b equals 3.1, and then we do type b, we can see that's a floating point number. If we set c to be true, and then we do type c, we can see that that's a Boolean. But we can change our mind halfway through the, the code if we wanted to. So I can say that c becomes equal to kev, and I can now look at what type C is, and that's now a class string. So this might introduce bugs in your code if you're not careful. You need to make sure that you don't change what you're using the variable for throughout your code. So if we want to include a library in our Arduino code, uh, we use the software library manager. So if I go to include library, and then let's include the software serial library, for example. The very top of my code there, it does hash include, and then with a little triangular bracket, software serial.h. And that tells the compiler to bring in the software serial library. And we can use that throughout our code. Down here, for example, we could say do software serial my serial. And that will set up a my serial object. Whereas over in MicroPython, if we want to include a library, we use import instead. So we can say import machine. That'll bring in all the functions from the machine library. A typical one we might bring in is the time function. We might want to bring in sleep. Now, rather than bringing in all the functions that are available in that library, because we're trying to cut down the amount of memory and space used on the device, we can actually just limit the functions that we want to pull in. So instead of doing import machine and just bringing everything in, we might say from machine import pin, for example, or UART, or whatever it is that we're bringing in. And then instead of saying import time, we might say from time import and then sleep. And then we can use those library functions. Now the libraries do need to be present on the board. So Machine is a built-in MicroPython library, so we don't need to have a, a, a machine.py file in our Pico file system. Uh, and similarly, time is also a built-in MicroPython library, so we don't need to bring that in as a separate external file as well. But anything else, we would need to do that. So for example, on here, I have an SSD 1306.py, and this is a library um, which enables us to use a 1306 LED display. So in this example blink program that we're working on here, we can see that there's a large chunk of comments at the top of the code. So we have forward slash and then star, and then we have a huge block of comments that tells us all about the code, where to get extra stuff from an example. Um, and then we have star and then forward slash to end that big code block. So that's a multi-line code block. And then we have single line comments that have the double forward slash, and they can be in between the code or they can actually be at the end of a line of code so for example on here we've got the end of this line here we've got double forward slash and then we says turn led on so in MicroPython we have a similar kind of thing so if we want to do a large code block what we will do is three speech marks and this can be a multi-line comment block new lines and extra text if we want to have a single comment line we use the hash or pound symbol if you're American and we can simply have a single line comment because if we go on to the next line it will try and it will treat that as code that can be at the end of a line of code so if we just do this here this is a code comment on one line so i'm over here now in visual studio just to give you an idea of what these 
docuStrings can be used for. So up here we've defined a function that says we'll switch on the relay for a number of seconds as defined in sleep seconds, which is that parameter just there. So if we come down to where that's actually used, switch on relay, and I just hover over that, Visual Studio understands what docuStrings are, and it will actually display that as help underneath the function name. So it says there, this will switch on the relay for a number of seconds in sleep seconds. Now over here back in the Arduino IDE, you can see that the naming convention of some of these variables that we've been using. So lie detector has a lowercase l and then a capital D to distinguish this as being another word in that string. Similar with um, software serial, you can see that's capital S, capital S again, and then we have lowercase m and then capital S for my serial. Pin mode has a lowercase p and a capital M. Um, digital write has a lowercase d and a capital W. This is called camel case. So if you think about the shape of a camel, it has a hump and it might have two humps. The hump refers to the capital letter to separate the two words. And this is very common with C, C++ and Arduino code. However, if we look at MicroPython, we tend to use underscores to separate words and everything's in lowercase. We do have a convention of using constants in uppercase. So if we have built in LED, might all be capitals, but we use the underscore to separate the words out. Whereas, whereas the little function that we have there has an underscore to separate the two words. And this is called snake case because it kind of looks all flat like a snake. Now the reason that we have camel case or snake case, these are called a house style. It's just a way of coding to be consistent with your, your naming conventions. So if you use the same naming convention throughout your code, other people can very easily read this and you can also read it back easier too. Um, so code that has a mixture of cases in it, different naming standards, is very hard to follow and you'll trip up and it's, it's just a bad programming practice. So pick a naming style. Snake case is the preferred one for Python whereas camel case is quite common on C, C++ for Arduino. So in C, whenever we want to define a block of code, we use these curly braces and that tells the compiler the start and the end of that code block. This just helps the compiler. It does mean that we can have indentation however we like within our code. So we could have our loads of indentation if we wanted to or, or absolutely none. It doesn't matter to the compiler. In fact, the compiler will strip out any what it calls white space, any spaces, and it will just look between the curly braces to define the code block. For each line of code, it will look to see if the semicolon is at the end of the line. So we can split things up like that. That's a valid line of code in C. Uh, but the convention is you keep uh, a line of code on a single line. So over in Python, we don't use curly braces to define code blocks, we use indentation. So let's create a new file here and let's just do a piece of code to print a message out. If we just run this on the computer, so we're just running this on the local Python interpreter. This code doesn't have any structure, it's just a single line, so we don't need to indent it. However, if we were going to define a function, this when I press return, it indents it by four spaces, and that's because functions, by default, the code block is four spaces indented. And then further down the code, we want to run that. We've removed the indentation once more, and we can run that piece of code like so. So if I run that, it'll say hello, and then hello world, because that function's defined, and then called. Now if I want to do an if statement in Python, if I say if a equals true, then do something. The colon at the end of the line there tells it that there's a code block coming next and therefore it indents it again for spaces. Uh, now if you have multiple indentations, if you say if b equals false, and actually they need to be double equals if we're doing a comparison, then it will indent it for spaces more again. This actually helps us make, make the code look more readable because the indentation helps the eye flow around the code. Um, and it also means that the compiler knows where the code blocks are because of the indentation. Now if we need to say else, we have to come back in and then the else is a has a colon at the end. That means it's another block of code, so uh, not false. So we haven't actually defined what A or B are, so let's just say A equals true. And let's run our code and it says hello. Now if B was actually true, then it will say not false. So over in the Arduino, we can say that the main program loop uh, is defined by this void loop. Every Arduino program has this, it has a setup function, and it also has a void loop, which is the main program loop. And that will loop over every single time the end of the loop has been reached, it will then execute the, the loop once more. In MicroPython, we don't have that. So if we have a program such as this 
hello world let's just get rid of if we have this and we run it it will run through that script so when it reaches the bottom of the script it will stop we can see there that with the REPL has stopped and it's no longer running any code so if we want this to run and run and run the convention is you say while true now we, we run the code it will run and run and run and run <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this video and you found this quite useful if you're moving from Arduino to MicroPython and if you get stuck on anything let me know in the comments and maybe I can help you out as well there is a group over on uh, Facebook called the Small Robots Group um, it's, we, ha we now have over 10,000 members in that group so if you get stuck with anything why not hop over to that group and we'll see if we can help you out so hopefully you found this video useful and I'll see you next time